welcome back. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well, training hard, and staying healthy. Uh, I have a question for you uh, to start this episode, and that is, what are you training for? When you train each day or each week, uh, is your program designed to get you to your goals? Uh, most athletes and general populations, for that matter, have a goal of getting stronger and more powerful. And I would even argue that endurance athletes have a goal of getting stronger and more powerful. But each sport is going to be slightly different or have different demands. Now, to simplify this, we put most training into one of two categories, either anaerobic or aerobic. Uh, today I'm going to focus on anaerobic training. Anaerobic training, by definition, is characterized by high-intensity, intermittent bounce of exercise that require uh, ATP to be regenerated much faster than in aerobic training. Think of this as exercises or movements uh, that last 10 seconds or less. We can even relate that to a specific sport and uh, categorize sports into anaerobic or aerobic training. Now, we don't usually use those terms when we're talking about sports, though. Uh, we usually refer to them as power or speed-based sports um, or endurance sports. Some of the more traditional sports that are high on the anaerobic side are sports like American football, baseball, basketball, hockey, uh, most track and field events, tennis, volleyball, uh, wrestling, golf, boxing, martial arts, and gymnastics. Uh, there are some that cross over, like swimming or soccer, uh, but I would even argue that those have a higher anaerobic demand unless you are talking about like distance events in swimming. Um, that is quite a few sports if you think about it. Notice the only ones not mentioned with anaerobic training are endurance sports like long distance running or rowing, uh, maybe cross country skiing, or like I mentioned, that those uh, long distance swimming events. Now, what do all those sports have in common? Um, they all require an athlete to be quick and powerful in short bursts. Going back to the definition of anaerobic training, uh, these sports all require high intensity, intermittent bounce of exercise followed by uh, rest breaks that allow ATP to be regenerated quickly. Now we train this way to increase power or improve power development. Uh, when we talk about anaerobic power, this refers to the maximal rate of energy or mechanical power produced during an exercise. Uh, this depends on the muscle mass involved, uh, motor unit recruitment, and the power to body mass ratio. Uh, peak power generated over a short amount of time, and we're talking about, uh, you know, over one second, uh, can be used to demonstrate anaerobic power. So what is a motor unit? The motor unit is defined as the functional unit of the uh, neuromuscular system. Now when you perform a lift or sprint or do anything else athletic uh, while training or in competition, um, all available motor units are activated within a muscle. Uh, the ability to generate force is affected by the firing rate uh, of that motor unit. An increase in firing rate is reflected by successive muscle contractions. Now, what this means is uh, the muscle fibers are continually activated repeatedly before they have time to completely relax. Uh, this is able to happen because the contractions overlap each other. The recruitment of motor units is controlled to a degree uh, by something called the size principle. Uh, now, the size principle refers to motor units being recruited in ascending order based on their recruitment thresholds and firing rates. You're probably familiar with the difference between uh, type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers. Um, I actually did a full learning with human kinetics on uh, muscle fibers that you can check out on our human kinetics YouTube channel. So, the motor units high in the recruitment order are used for speed and power production. This also helps explain why muscle fibers get larger with heavy resistance training. The muscle fibers are recruited in this case to produce high levels of force uh, required to lift heavier loads. Now, in some cases, we'll see an athlete uh, inhibit the lower threshold motor units in favor of activating higher threshold motor units. This is called selective recruitment and happens especially in movements like Olympic weightlifting or plyometrics or speed and agility. Uh, think of it this way, if it, it would be difficult for a basketball player to go up for a rebound jump and go through the recruitment process of slow twitch motor units before getting to the fast twitch motor units. Now if that happened, the athlete wouldn't be as quick and as, as explosive. Now when we're thinking about what exercises to do in training uh, for your sport or how programming should look, uh, we need to look at the demands of the sport. Uh, and 
one reason uh, to train for anaerobic power is to build resistance to fatigue. Now, in other words, uh, how powerful can you be with limited recovery between reps? This comes into play virtually in all power-based sports. Uh, think of American football and being as powerful and as quick as you can for roughly 10 seconds. Unless you're getting subbed out for a play, you have about 30 to 45 seconds, um, give or take, uh, before you have to be super powerful and explosive again. If you're not, you're going to probably risk injury. Uh, if we're talking about specific training examples for strength and power, uh, we might look at a heavy uh, deadlift or a heavy squat. Um, this will definitely help increase overall strength and power. And if you're considering the transference to sport, think about the time it takes to perform a heavy repetition. A football defensive lineman, for example, needs to be powerful and needs to be able to explode as soon as the ball is snapped. Uh, he needs to be able to fend off the block of the offensive lineman and uh, get to the quarterback or the ball carrier as fast as possible. Now, if we're training in the gym, heavy lifts like a squat or deadlift or moving into the Olympic lifts need to mimic that uh, to be fast and explosive. Um, if you are training for power, uh, we're talking about <clears throat> moving weight in mere seconds or even fractions of a second. And we can train this in the gym and help build up that resistance to fatigue. Uh, another example might be a high jump in track and field. Uh, if a jumper takes his or her attempt, whether it's successful or not, uh, there's a limited amount of time before the next attempt has to be taken. Uh, that's usually a minimum of about three minutes, depending on the level and the number of uh, competitors remaining in the event. But the point here is that jumpers are asked to give max effort on an attempt and then ideally get full recovery in a matter of minutes before giving max effort again. Now, taking this back to training, uh, you can do high velocity exercises to get quicker and more powerful, uh, but to also improve your fatigue resistance uh, and max effort reps. Now, by max effort, I'm generally referring to things like max effort sprints. Now, if you improve your fatigue resistance, the goal is to be able to go all out for longer periods of time or to be more powerful repeatedly. Uh, you can see how this would translate uh, directly to a sport. Now, if you're training uh, for a specific sport though, uh, like we always talk about, you need to train for the demands of the sport. Now, this means combining anaerobic training, uh, or, sorry, it means not uh, combining anaerobic training with aerobic training, or at least uh, making sure that you walk that fine line. Uh, combining resistance training and aerobic endurance training might interfere with your strength or power gains, uh, primarily if aerobic endurance training is high in intensity, volume, or frequency. Now, one research study showed that uh, simultaneous sprint and aerobic endurance training decreased sprint speed and explosive power. Uh, possible explanations could point to adverse neural changes and the alterations of muscle proteins in the muscle fibers. Now, in contrast, most studies uh, show no adverse effects on an or, sorry, aerobic power uh, after doing heavy resistance training. What does that mean? A power or speed-based athlete could be hurt by excessive aerobic endurance training, but an endurance athlete will likely not be hurt by anaerobic training like strength or power training. Uh, Kramer and colleagues did a study in 1995 uh, where they looked at the potential incompatibility of combining strength and endurance exercise uh, and found that there was a change in muscle fiber size in the thigh. Now they saw a change from type 2X muscle fibers to type 2A muscle fibers. Uh, this showed that heavy resistance training recruits more uh, type 2X fibers than high intensity aerobic endurance interval training. Uh, power development can be negatively affected uh, more than strength during concurrent high intensity resistance and aerobic endurance training. Um, this takes me back uh, to the example of training the track and field athletes. Now, you would never have, or I should say you, you probably shouldn't have, your 100 meter or 200 meter sprinters uh, training with the long distance runners. Uh, I would even argue that you don't even want your 400 meter sprinters training with long distance runners. And the same goes for jumpers. Unless you're running the 1600 to 3200, the long jumpers and high jumpers should uh, probably train with the sprinters so that they can continue uh, developing their fast twitch muscles and focus on high threshold motor unit recruitment. Now, on the other hand, the distance runners will actually improve their times if they occasionally train with the sprinters, uh, so they're recruiting more fast twitch type two muscle fibers. 
Training for anaerobic power uh, takes consideration of planning, uh, but can go a long way in increasing strength and developing power. Uh, in the end, this all goes back to previous discussions about you know, training your body to get the adaptations you're looking for based on your end goal. Uh, we've only scratched the surface today on anaerobic training, uh, but in addition to things I've mentioned, anaerobic training also has positive effects on bones, connective tissue, and hormones. Um, I might get to those in another episode of Learning with Human Kinetics. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about anaerobic training, I recommend NSCA's Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, uh, High Performance Training for Sports, uh, Developing the Athlete, uh, and you can't go wrong with Scientific Foundations and Practical Applications of Periodization, uh, which seems to uh, have an endless amount of information. Uh, shout out to Greg Hoff for that one. Uh, if you want to dive deeper into the topic, I encourage you to always look up research, and you can do that in our Human Kinetics journals, and look up other episodes of Learning with Human Kinetics on our YouTube channel, um, as well as some of our Author Talk episodes. As always, thank you for spending a few minutes of your time with me today to learn a little more about anaerobic training. Uh, I hope you're able to take away at least a few bits of information that will help you in your training. Um, thanks again, and until next time, stay strong, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next episode.